All right, good afternoon. So welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Megan Ladd. I am the certification specialist uh, for the Certified Corporate Financial Planning and Analysis Certification Program or the FPAC professional. Also on our call is Kendall Frederick. He is our Director of Training Content. So I will start the presentation today by providing a brief overview of the program, its development and content, and then Kendall will speak to test taking strategies and exam preparation. A few housekeeping notes. Um, again, we are recording the presentation. The recording will be posted to the website. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please enter them into the Q&A box. Uh, I will try and provide an answer as the presentation progresses. Anything that I'm not able to answer during the presentation, um, we will save to the end and Kendall and I can circle back to those questions. And with that, we'll get started. So let's review our agenda for today. Uh, the session will provide a brief introduction to the FPAC professional credential. We'll then cover the exam structure, and then Kendall will go into an overview of the exam prep platform and then study strategies more in depth. So before we get started on our uh, preparation for the exam, I'd like to provide you with a brief history of the FPAC Professional Certification Program, just so you have a better understanding of the origins of the content and the preparation material and of the examination itself. Uh, so the first step in developing any certification and training program is to define the role of the professional. So in our case, an FP&A, financial planning analysis professional. So in order to define the role of FP&A, we conducted, we being AFP, the Association for Financial Professionals, conducted what's called a job task analysis. That is a survey um, that we send out to corporate practitioners, so people just like yourself, asking them what is included as a part of FP&A. So what tasks and duties does an FP&A professional perform on a daily basis? So we took the results of that survey, that job task analysis, um, and uh, we used it to develop what's called the test specifications of the examination. And the test specifications are basically an outline of everything that's included in the exam. So every skill, every ability, every piece of knowledge um, that you might be asked about, that came from that survey of FP&A professionals. So corporate practitioners that told us what they need to know in order to perform their jobs. So there is a comprehensive list um, that can be downloaded from the FPAC website. And in case you haven't been to our website yet, it is fpacert.org. So easy to remember. So these knowledge domains not only define the skills and abilities of financial planning and analysis, but they are intended to set the standard for best practice for the FP&A profession as a whole. So following the completion of these test specifications, we recruited subject matter experts, again, corporate FP&A practitioners, uh, you know, your peers in the field, people just like yourself, to, to write and review all of the items that were used on the test. So all of the questions that you'll see on the exam came from FP&A uh, practitioners. So these weren't, you know, random people writing uh, questions for the test. These are actual people working in corporate FP&A. The last step was to set the standards for recertification. So the FPAC does require 45 hours of continuing education to be earned and submitted every three years. So um, the goal of every certification program, again, is to set the standard of best practice for a profession. So by choosing the FPAC program, you are demonstrating the knowledge and skills required to perform in the field of financial planning and analysis. You're passing a rigorous exam, you're meeting certain education and work experience requirements, and you're agreeing to abide by a professional code of conduct and keep your knowledge current through continuing education. So now that you have some background information regarding the development of the program, let's dig a bit deeper into the test itself. The FPAC exam consists of two parts. 
So part one is financial acumen. And part two is financial analysis and business support. Each exam part consists of three knowledge domains, and you can think of the knowledge domains as specific areas of focus. So part one consists of general business and finance concepts, knowledge of business partnering, and knowledge of systems and technology. Part one is 140 multiple choice questions, and it takes two and a half hours to complete. Part two consists of knowledge of business communications, performance of analysis and projections, and building of models and analytics. It has only 55 questions, um, but these questions are what we call task-based simulations, which are spreadsheet-based questions, and then scenario or case analysis problems. It does take four hours to complete. So even though there are less questions, they do take longer because they are more time intensive. Now the pie chart here shows you roughly how many items for each knowledge domain may appear on your test, but I do want to clarify that these numbers are not exact. Um, the exact number of items from each domain can really vary depending on the form or the version of the exam that you receive on the day you go to take the test, but this will give you a good idea of approximately how many questions you'll have. So now that we've reviewed the three knowledge domains of each exam, here are some examples of what is included in each knowledge domain. So again, the exact number of questions can vary depending on the form or the version of the exam that you receive, but this will give you a good general idea. So I'll go ahead and let you all read through that slide as I continue talking. Uh, again, part one has 140 multiple choice questions and part two is 55 questions excuse me, 45 questions are task-based simulations. Again, those are spreadsheet-based questions. And 10 of those questions are case analysis questions. So during the examination, you will have the opportunity to review questions during the multiple choice section of part one and during the task-based simulation section of part two. You are able to uh, change answers, mark questions for review or skip questions. However, in the case analysis section of part two of the exam, you are not permitted to skip or go back to questions. So the way case analysis items work is that each step is scored independently and points are awarded for selecting appropriate action or avoiding appropriate action. And the questions progress and each have multi multiple steps, which is why you aren't able to go back and review previous steps. So it's important to remember that when you're taking the exam and you're in that case analysis section, you once you make your selections and move to the next step, you can't go back to a previous step. Something else to keep in mind for part two, if you finish the uh, task-based simulations before your time expires, leftover time does not carry over to the case analysis question. So you wanna make sure to go back and use any remaining time you have to review those task-based simulations before you progress to the case analysis questions. Um, if your time expires while taking the exam, all of the questions, regardless of how they're marked, will be calculated into your score. Um, there are no penalty for incorrect answers. So it's in your best interest to guess if you aren't able to answer any questions, if you're running out of time, um, make your best guess. Um, if, and you can always guess and then come back to the question later if you do end up having time at the end of that section. So again, no wrong answers are counted against you. So just make sure you fill something in um, for each of the items. So now that we've gone over the examination, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kendall, and he is going to speak about preparation and test taking tips. Thanks, Megan. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so there's a few resources we want to talk about on the exam. Uh, the first one is calculators. So the testing center will not allow you to bring anything into the testing room other than your ID. All personal effects, effects are placed in a locker. Scratch paper or whiteboard will be provided for calculation work. Within both parts of the exam, you'll have two calculators available for you, a simple four-function calculator and a scientific calculator similar to a TI-30XS. For most calculations where you aren't provided a spreadsheet to work within, 
the four function calculator will be will be sufficient. The scientific calculator will more easily handle exponents, though, if you're given a present value or net present value calculation. Next slide, please. All right, so Megan talked about the task-based simulation questions. So we can speak in more depth about what you'll actually see with these questions. And so it's a spreadsheet tool. We don't call it an Excel emulator. Uh, it's very similar to the spreadsheet tool if you've taken the CTP exam. I'm sorry, not the CTP exam, the CPA exam. So the top part is the problem statement. This is essentially a word problem that provides out the information that you need to calculate. The answer area is in yellow, and then it may be multiple parts. In this one, it requires a change and then the direction of the change. Then you have your data set or data table. Uh, this will be in purple, and this will show the information that's necessary to re a reference to solve the question. And then below that, you'll have an open worksheet. And here you're able to do all of your calculations, reference the cells in purple, and, and solve the problem. So uh, because the spreadsheet tool is not quite like Excel, there are some uh, functions that we should go over real quick. So let's flip to the next slide. So here you can see the, uh, the options that you have available. The command line is very similar to Excel. Your font size, your format brush, undo, zoom control is very similar. One of the things that you'll notice that's different is reset problem. So if you find that you have accidentally deleted some of the data or you're going down a wrong path, you can reset the problem back to its original state. Keep in mind that this will remove any of your calculations. As you're working through the spreadsheet problems, I would just uh, advise that uh, you, you don't have to focus on the prettiness of the spreadsheet. It's really just there for you to do your calculations. So once you've read the question, think about what's the fastest way to get from point A to point B, and then go ahead and make those calculations. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so one of the, uh, the functions or features of the spreadsheet tool, uh, yeah, there you go, jump back, thank you, is that uh, it doesn't have a wizard like Excel. So it can do many of the functions that are available in Excel, but you won't get a hint. So if you type equals PV and then open parent, it will not tell you that the next term is rate and then the term and then the payment. You'll have to know those, but it will function just like Excel. So if you have a present value calculation, just know that you'll need to know in what order the terms go, the rate, the term, the payment, the future value if necessary, and the type if you're doing that. So that'll work for all of your other uh, normal calculations, NPV, uh, PV, it just won't provide you with that that wizard, So, but it will function. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, the case analysis questions. So this question type was added to the exam in 2019 revision and the material of the material in the exam and the question type, we see the most student trepidation around. Now, let me say that this question type will pull on both your learnings through your exam prep and your professional experience. They are most like your day job where you're asked to make decisions on the appropriateness of activities with each new project or task. You'll be presented with a case study that is broken down to three or four steps. You'll get a scenario and then you're asked to select all of the actions that are appropriate based on the information in that step. There are multiple appropriate or correct actions for each step. So let me repeat that. If you only select one action per step, you won't score very well in this section. So it's important that you look and find all of the appropriate actions. And so we'll actually look at one of those questions now. Okay, so on, part, uh, on the left side of your screen, uh, what you see is in the left side column, you have step one, which gives you information about the problem. Then the right side gives you all of the answers that could be selected. And so it'll be important that you look for the information that you actually need to solve for. So in the last sentence on this one, it says an FP&A professional has been tasked with coordinating the gross margin projection for the 12 months following the launch of the product. Okay, so the, it, it's key that you pay attention to this because in this case, it gave you that you are an FP&A analyst looking at gross margin projection. So any answers that aren't, would not impact gross margin would not be correct. And so you can already see on the right-hand side, some answers that wouldn't be as important, such as, uh, you know, gather the projected marketing cost for the launch. Well, that would fall into SGNA. It doesn't go into gross profit. So, so it wouldn't be important. 
remember gross margin is your, your revenue minus your cost of goods sold divided by revenue. So any answers that would impact those two lines, revenue and cost of goods sold, would be an appropriate step. Those that are below it would not. So revenue projections for the number of units to be sold, that's important. Gathering sales price information, you need that information. Uh, and then there was one, um, oh yes, uh, the first one is gather the tax implications, implications associated with the launch of the new product. Because the you know tax falls way down below gross margin, that would not be an acceptable answer at this stage. Once you've completed step one and you've selected all the answers, as Megan said, you'll step into step two, which may give you additional information. You won't be able to go back to step one. So make sure that you've selected all the answers that you feel are correct before you move on to the next one. It may be possible for you to see data sets provided in these. We'll have you flip over to the next slide. If a data set is provided, like you see in step two, by clicking on the data set, you can see that it'll, it'll show the information in the bottom. And so you can expand that out. If you need to do any calculations, the spreadsheet tool will function just like it does in the, the uh, task-based simulations part of the exam. All right, let's go one more slide. So for case analysis questions, uh, just to review, uh, some steps may have exhibits or data tables. If they do, you'll just you can expand those out. Answer options do not change based on previously selected answers. So in step two reveals that the professionals in the case study pursued an action you selected or didn't select. It doesn't mean that you are right or wrong. It just means there's more information in the case. And you'll select all of the answers based on the appropriateness of that information in that step. So don't get ahead of yourself thinking about you know, running down the rabbit hole about all of the options that you could do. Focus on just the information in that step. And as always, points are awarded for selecting appropriate actions, and points may be deducted for selecting not appropriate actions. So, you'll, so you really want to be careful in this part. Go on to the next slide. So there are important formulas that you do need to remember uh, for the uh, for the uh, the exam. So we don't provide any of these formulas to you in the exam. Uh, there are about 110 that are provided through the exam prep platform, and so you'll need to to remember these. Uh, these are financial ratios economic value add, your time value formulas. You'll need to be aware of cost accounting and the formulas that go around that. Activity-based costing, uh, direct versus indirect and accruals. Statistics such as standard deviation, mean, and mode. Uh, some economics information, as well as headcount calculations. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so we do provide a resource that's available for preparing uh, for the examination. This is the FP, FPAC exam prep platform. This is developed by AFP and contains all of the inf information that you would need to pass the exam. Some of the highlights of it is we do have 18 hours of instructor-led videos, 25 hours of digital reading material, either available through, the, uh, through your web browser or through a downloadable PDF, five case studies, more than 550 end of topic knowledge checks, as well as three timed practice exams that are available. In total, there are 1,047 questions in the exam prep platform, or as we call it, the EPP for short. So we'll go on to the next slide. So the, the FPAC exam prep platform has three modalities that you can use. The first one is assess your current knowledge. As soon as you log in the first time, you'll, you'll be asked to complete a pretest. And what this will do is this will map out what knowledge areas you have strength and what areas you may have weakness and you need to refresh on. Once you have that information, you can use it to then uh, do your, your study and practice section. So this is the 25 chapters, the videos, the flashcards, all the questions that go into it. This is everything that you need to prepare. And then the last modality is really kind of assessing where you are. And we have this through a post test that's available on the platform, as well as the three timed practice exams, one for each different type of exam question that's available in the actual exam. We'll move on to the next slide. So as I talked about, we could step you through this. So you'll complete the self-assessment. Uh, there's actually a box in the, uh, the EPP itself that'll say what your strengths and weaknesses are, and that won't be populated until the first time you take that self-assessment. Once you do, it populates the recommendation engine all throughout the platform, and it'll tell you where you have strengths, where you have weakness, 
And when you go to launch each chapter, it will tell you whether this is a chapter that was you should focus on based on that self-assessment. So the first time you take the pre-test, it will calculate, it'll formulate these recommendations for you. You can take the pre-test more often than that, but it's that that first attempt that will actually uh, load the uh, recommendation engine. So within each pretest attempt, you can actually review uh, how you uh, how you did by chapter. So in this one, part one, domain A, chapter one, uh, this student completed five of eight questions. And so it's marked as they did pretty well. Uh, on chapter three of that same part and domain, they got one out of eight correct. And so that would be weak and that would be a, a chapter that they should spend more time on. And so that's one that, that uh, will be flagged throughout the system so you can see that. Go on to the next slide. So in that study and practice section, uh, we've broken the material down into easily digestible chunks for you. So we have the full course material, which is about 900 pages of material. We break it into parts, so part one and part two. And then we break that into the domains that match up uh, loosely with the domains of the, uh, the knowledge of the KSAs that uh, Megan talked about for the exam. Then we break that into chapters uh, you know, that are related material within those uh, domains and then further down into topics. And so these are subsets of chapters. And at the end of each topic, we'll have a knowledge check for you. So you can check how you're doing on just that part of the topic that you just read. It's also a great way to review, to go back through and make sure that you are uh, you know, grasping a topic again after you haven't looked at it in a little while. Again, no activity is, uh, is limited in the platform. You can take them as many times as you want. We have over 550 of these knowledge check questions over 300 definitional flashcards, over 100 formula flashcards, five case studies. Uh, we haven't asked the experts. So if you have content or technical issues, I actually, actually answer all of those. So you can send those in and, uh, and I'll get back to you. And then we also have uh, the Collaborate FPNA prep community. So all of your student, all the students who are preparing for the exam at the same time have access to this tool. And it's a great way to form study groups, to get clarification on content from other students. And so uh, you can use the social part of it to help uh, your studies. Next slide. So from here, this is the, uh, the main study and practice portion of the exam prep platform. And so in this case, to launch chapter one, you would just select launch and it would take you into it. Before we go to the next slide, I will have you call out. You see those exclamation points in black circles. That's populated by the recommendation engine. So that's showing which chapters you should focus on based on that self-assessment but we'll go ahead and launch chapter one to start there. From there, it'll take you to the chapter one homepage. And so you have the chapter video, which uh, has an instructor to, that will uh, give you the highlights of that chapter. And then you can go through every single topic. So you watch the video first, and then you can review the reading material. Yeah, in order to review it on the platform, you need a persistent internet connection. So say you're going to be uh, on an airplane or the subway and you wanna download these, uh, by checking on the red text on the right that says view all chapter text content, you can pull down a downloadable PDF, uh, which is indexed and has a uh, speech or text to speech capabilities. And you can listen to it or read whenever you're away from your computer. At the end of each topic, when you launch it, when you get to the bottom, it will have that knowledge check. And so you can check against if you've uh, actually retained the material uh, as you've read through it. So we'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so the, here is the, uh, the post-test portion. So once you've studied all of the material, we have a post-test that will cover all of the material on the platform and give you an idea, a quick snapshot of how you're doing, which is not timed. And then we have these practice exams. And so uh, these correspond with uh, the three modalities that we do on the test. So uh, practice exam one mimics exactly the, the uh, test one that you get in the center. It's 140 multiple choice questions. It has the same timer. And then you can review each attempt at the end. Um, if for some reason you run out of time, the main difference is on the platform, the countdown will, will, will flip over to red and begin counting up. So that way you don't lose your attempt. What you get is you get to see how close you were to finishing in the allotted time. So practice exam two is broken into two parts since we uh, we actually have separate timers for those on the exam uh, itself. And so the first is that 45 task-based simulations. These are the ones where you're giving a data set and then a spreadsheet and you make the calculations. And then section two is that 10 case analysis questions that we covered. And so these are all timed. 
the same as you would have at the exam itself. Go to the next slide. All right, so recommended study strategies. So now that you understand about the exam and, and the resources that are available for you, the, the most crucial thing is to make a study plan that works for you. You know how you learn at this point. You've, you've gone through all of your com compulsory education, your, your college degree, probably other certifications. You know what works best for you. And, but it's very important that you set time aside each week to make sure that you're hitting those goals. If you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. It really does take over 72 hours to study for this exam. So you have to set time aside in a place that works for you to do that. Your study plan should be based on your knowledge gaps and the number of questions on, on the topic. So we called out that I think a full half of the questions on part one are in that domain A. So you wanna make sure that you really do spend extra time on domain A since that's where the, the main number of questions are. And then review all test specifications. So anything that, that, that uh, on those test specifications can be on the exam. And so those are outside of the platform. They're available on our website. We have them listed in the, uh, the additional resources at the end of this presentation. But make sure that you pay attention to those and practice all the calculations, both by hand and by spreadsheet. So we do have a link that's available at the end of this presentation that'll take you to a, uh, basically the spreadsheet tool and you can see how it functions. You want to make sure that you're doing calculations in there, that you get comfortable with the functionality of that spreadsheet. If the first time you have moved from Excel to the spreadsheet tool is the day of your exam, you're going to have difficulty and you're going to lose valuable time. So make sure that you're utilizing that tool. Go to the next slide. All right, uh, make sure that you you look at the big picture. So and what we mean by that is understanding how of the, how the parts and the domains connect together. When we talk about uh, financial ratios, how are those used in forecasting in part two? So making sure that you get a good understanding of, of the world of FP&A and all the connections that happen there. There are definitely some shortcuts that you can take. Uh, look for connections within the material. So in this one, we called out the word two means to divide. So if you have a question that's about uh, total debt to total net assets, that two in the middle means divide. Uh, there are other shortcuts. Whenever you have a margin question, it usually means that you're dividing something by revenues. So make use of some of those, uh, of, of those connections in the material as well. I would also recommend that you allow for a few weeks of review between completing the material and your test appointment. And so I know you're all going to be on top of it. If you're going to schedule in the, in the next window, you know, maybe schedule in that first half of the window and then plan to, to end and give yourself two full weeks of review, going back and looking at the knowledge checks, the practice exams, focusing on the areas where you might be weak before you walk into the exam. We'll go on the, uh, the next one. All right, so uh, this one is pretty self-explanatory, but it's, uh, it, and it's not an indictment of any student. It's rather just a fact of human nature. It becomes hard to recall information that we don't need or don't use with any regularity. Uh, the part of the reason, this is part of the reason why I'd recommend that students take both exams in the same window, not the same day, that's borderline crazy, uh, but allow for several weeks between test appointments. Uh, the fundamentals tested in part one do prove to be helpful in writing exam part two. We see higher pass rates among students who do both exams in the same window. Repetition is the key to retention. So you can't read the material just once and expect that you're going to remember some of it you will forget 78% within a month. So you have to go back and make sure that you're making those connections. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, a few other test taking tips. So be prepared. And by that, we mean know exactly where you're going. Uh, if any of you have ever tested for uh, professional certifications, sometimes these centers aren't always in the most uh, you know, logical place to find. They're a suite and a business park. So make sure you know exactly where it is in that business park and that you know where the door is to get there, that you've driven it and you understand the traffic patterns so you can get there on time. You don't want to be rushed when you get there. Make sure you get a good night's sleep right before the exam. Uh, this one is highlighted in yellow because it is really important. As part of the test taking process, you do complete a non-disclosure agreement, essentially agreeing that you will not share questions from the exam with other students. When this pops up, you have three minutes to complete that NDA. So make sure that you accept. If you don't, 
your test attempt will end and you and for, for that and you will have to re-register in the next window to take the exam. So make sure that you complete that NDA. Okay, once you've gone through the tutorial, completed the NDA and the exam actually starts, you see your timer in question one, this is when you can be, this is when you can begin to do your formula dump. And so what this is uh, for students who are not familiar with it, some students prefer at that point to take their scratch paper and write down as many formulas as they can that they can remember and get them out of their head. So once that timer starts, then you can do this. And it's up to you whether you, you know, you choose to, to exercise the formula dump or not. Just timing wise, you have to wait until the exam starts. Lastly, control your nerves and focus on your task at hand. These testing centers, uh, you know, proctor a number of different exams. And so you might have a student who's sitting next to you who is taking, uh, you know, the, the MCAT for medical school or the LSAT for law school, and they might not be prepared. So don't let their stress and frustration impact your exam. You're taking a different test. Most likely you'll be the only person testing the FPAC on that day. So don't let their anxiety be contagious to you. All right, uh, move on to the next one. All right, some, some test taking tips. Read and reread the questions for full understanding. So even the task-based simulations where you, are, where you feel like you might be running low on time, it's very important that you understand what you're being asked. And so read the whole question and then sometimes read it backwards, you know, each sentence and look for that question mark that shows you the actual ask of the question. It's, it's uh, I, I would hate for you to get one wrong simply because you misread the question. You didn't ask what we were asking for. Trust your first impressions and avoid overanalyzing. So uh, especially if you have a question um, that, that you're not sure on the answer, you select the best answer and then you flag it uh, and you come back to it. If you come back to it and you still cannot find an, a, a concrete reason to change off of that answer, I would leave it. Your first instinct is usually right. Uh, another test taking tip is think of your answer before reading the choices. So as you read the question stem, think in your mind what you think the correct answer might be and then check and see if it's among the options. Eliminate obvious wrong choices, evaluate possible right choices. So you have four question options for every single question that's multiple choice. If you know that two of those are wrong and it's a choice between say B and D, well, even if you guess at that point, you have a 50% chance of getting it right versus just a 25% if you hadn't eliminated those answers. So look for those keywords, really understand what we're asking in those keywords. We talked about if you, uh, you know, if it's a margin question, then you know you're dividing by revenue. If uncertain, enter an answer, flag the question, return the question at the end. So Megan mentioned that you don't get penalized for wrong answers. So if you flag a question, I would put it in answer regardless. That way, if you don't have time to get back to that and check every single flag, you at least have a minimum of a 25% chance of getting credit for that question. We'll move on to the next slide. All right, and, and this, this is us. I'm Kendall Frederick, I'm the Director of Training Content. So I manage all of the, uh, the EPPs, both the CTP and the FPAC. So if you have content questions, I'll be your guide on your journey there. And Megan Ladd is our Certification Specialist for the FPAC. She talks about the FPAC every single day and she's your guide on your journey as you move from studying into testing for the certification. So with that, was there anything I missed, Megan? I think you got it all. Uh, thank you so much. We do have a couple questions in the Q&A that um, I need your help with. Okay. And so someone asked um, if you can clarify a bit the way the case analysis questions are scored and if partial credit is awarded if you select correct options, but not all. Yes. So uh, the best way to think about that um, is, um, is on those is you are awarded credit for each correct answer you select, You're, and you don't get credit for each correct answer you don't select, and then you, you lose credit for each incorrect answer you select. So in that case, if, you, if there are six answer options and four are correct and two are incorrect, and you select three of the correct ones and one of the incorrect ones, then essentially you'd be getting partial credit. You would get, I kept track of my answer there, you get three points for the correct ones, you wouldn't get any points for the fourth one and you would lose a point for the incorrect one. So in that case, you would have three points out of a possible, I think four for that, that question. Great, thank you. 
Um, there is another question. Is there a best practice approach for when to attempt the practice exams in the EPP? Yeah, so we don't actually lock any activities. You're able to, to go into the EPP and do everything uh, that you'd like. Uh, I would say that, that I would save those time practice exams for after you have completed all of the chapters, you've done all of the knowledge checks and the post-test and then sit down and take those. So really make sure that you understand all of the concepts and the material that you've gone through those uh, before you attempt those timed practice exams. Um, so those are the only questions in the Q&A right now. Again, if anyone on the call has any questions, please enter that into the Q&A box. Um, I am seeing some questions in chat, so I'm going to answer those questions in chat. Um, for anyone who has questions about a part one exam waiver, I am putting a link in the chat. All the information about the waiver can be found on that page of our website. Um, there is a question about um, formulas, Kendall. Um, in the um, Excel, the um, external spreadsheet um, within the exam, which is not Excel, just to clarify, um, does the ex does the sheet reference to cells and highlight these cells as a part of the formula? So I don't know if it highlights the cells. We do have that tool. Flip over to the next page, if you would, real quick, uh, Megan, for the slide. So the, uh, go forward. Oh, sorry. That's all right. So there we the go. Exam functionality tutorial on there. You can actually go into an instance and see how it works. You can reference cells, though. So. Uh, so you can reference cells that are in the uh, the data set part that's provided to you without having to retype those. And I know Kendall mentioned this already, but again, it is extremely important that you utilize that functionality tutorial. There are a number of videos that you'll need to watch to understand how the spreadsheet works. You can download a practice spreadsheet. You need to do that and practice with it before the exam. The spreadsheet is not Excel. It is a little different. And so you there's a learning curve there. Um, so in order to be best prepared, you really need to practice with that spreadsheet in advance. Otherwise, you're going to be struggling a bit when you're taking the test. That's the feedback I hear uh, from students the most is, is make sure to spend some time with that, uh, that spreadsheet tool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so looking at the Q&A box. Yeah, so I saw a question that came in about the, uh, without much, taking the exam without much experience. Yes. So the FPAC does differ from the CTP where you don't have to qualify to take the exam uh, based on work experience before you take it. But before you're awarded the FPAC, you would have to meet the work requirements. So if you pass everything and you say short a year of experience, once you meet that year of experience, within five years of completing your exam, then you'd be able to claim your FPAC certification. So a couple questions about the webinar and the PowerPoint. Um, so yes, the webinar was recorded. A link will be posted to the website um, on the webinars page. And I'll go ahead and put the link to that in the chat if I can find it. OK, so in the chat, there is a link to the webinars page. This recording will be posted there. Um, so you'll have that for reference. And we'll also post um, the slides as well. Yeah, I would say that, uh, that, that there is a lot of value to the certification and Megan and I love talking about it. So if you come up with a question afterwards, I mean, uh, we could flip back one page on the slide. You can find us. We're probably two of the easiest people to find at AFP and ask us questions and we'd be happy to help you out with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do see some questions that are specific to applications um, and previous attempts on the exam. If you have questions that are specific to your experience with the exam or your application, reach out to me directly with those questions um, via email. My email is on the slide here, and that way we can chat about that outside of the webinar. Um, so another question about um, waivers. Um, I posted the link to the waiver um, in the chat. So um, if you 
are trying to apply for a waiver for part one, you just need to follow the instructions on that web page. Um, so question, how long is the FPAC certification valid? So um, it is valid for three years initially um, because it is a certification, recertification is required. Um, and we do require 45 hours of continuing education credits and those have to be earned and submitted every three years in order to continue to renew the credential. What is the percentage of people that pass? So the pass rates for part one and part two are a little different. Um, I believe the pass rate for part one is in the six, around 60, 62%. Um, and the pass rate for part two is a little bit lower, maybe in the upper 50%. Um, I haven't looked at the numbers from the last testing window, but typically they're within the 50 to 60% range for both parts which is um, actually very high for certification programs. Most certifications have a lower than a 50% pass rate. So um, we're very happy with that. And that pass rate is higher than uh, the CTP, if you're familiar with that program. Um, so someone asked about a passing mark or percentage for the exams. So the way that the exams are scored is on a scaled scoring system um, because there are multiple versions of the exam. You know, someone, if you have two people going in to take part one of the exam, they might not receive the exact version, same version of, of part one. They might receive different forms. So those forms have to be equated, right? So that they're scored equally. So that's what's called a scaled scoring system. Um, and we do have a page on the website that explains it very in depth, but the uh, there's a range of scaled score. It's 300 to 800 and 500 is the scaled score passing mark. So um, if you receive a 500 or higher, then you pass. If you, re you receive lower than a 500, then you do not pass. Um, so, and that is the same for both part one and part two. And so again, it depends on the form of the exam that you receive. Um, some people think, well, I got a, a 498 or a 495 is I only missed one question. That's not necessarily the case. It depends on the form of the exam you receive and how that exam, how the uh, questions on the exam are scaled. Um, and each form has a different formula that they use to scale those items. So um, it could be one question. It could have been five questions. Um, it really depends. So I'm going to put a link to the explanation of the scoring in the chat. So if you wanna read more about that, you can do that. But skill scoring is an industry standard in standardized testing. Almost every single standardized test you take is a scaled scoring system. Yes, yeah, so we had a couple questions on the continuing education. So if your continuing education lapses and you have not contacted AFP to apply for an extension, then you would have to pass both parts of the exam again in order to earn the certification. So it's really important that if you find yourself in the end of the three year period that you contact certification and, and, and see what you can work out there. Um, it's really only 15 credits per year. And so it's like uh, 1.2 per month. Uh, for the 45 CPE credits, uh, does uh, AFP provide? We do some uh, webinars that qualify for, for credit. If you come to the conference, most of the sessions will, uh, will uh, count towards your continuing education. And so I found with, you know, a, a, attending conference every other year, I never really had to worry about uh, the amount of education. If you're a CPA, much of the, uh, the, the continuing education that you have to earn there will also apply towards your certification. Uh, so there's a number of different places to earn it. Uh, it it's not just through AFP. There is a question about copy and pasting your answer from the working area to the answer box. Is that something that you, you can do in the spreadsheet? So uh, what I would recommend uh, is that you not do that, um, but rather that you retype the answer into the actual answer box. Uh, and the reason that is, is um, the answer box is set up to accept plus or minus a certain percentage of the actual answer. And so rather than referencing a cell and having any kind of problem where it might paste incorrectly, your cell references is just to type it into the cell box. And uh, as long as you've done the formula correct, you'll be within plus and minus of that uh, rounding tolerance and you should be fine. 
Okay, I think we've answered most of the questions. Um, I'm going to put a link in chat also to recertification since uh, it seemed like several people had questions about recertification. So if you go to that page of the website, you can find pretty much all the answers you need to know about how to recertify once you get to that point. Um, last call for any questions in the Q&A box. There was a question about CPE hours again. Uh, so, you know, uh, when we talk about continuing professional development or, or recertification hours it, it, or CPE, is, you're essentially talking about the same thing. It just needs to be make sure that it's in a financial field. And the way it works out is one credit hour is 50 minute of instructions, which I think is standard for, for uh, CPE for CPAs as well. Great. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions popping up. Um, I will put one more link into the chat, and this is just a deadlines and fees link. Um, the final deadline for this upcoming testing window is coming up. It is June 17th. So you have 16 days if you decide you want to test in this upcoming August, September testing window to submit your application for that window. Um, and it typically takes us uh, a week or two to get back on the application. Um, I know that I had someone ask a question about an application that they submitted. Um, I do apologize. I had COVID last week, so I'm a little behind on checking applications. So if you're waiting to hear back from me, um, I will follow up with you this week. I apologize for that. Um, the webinar was recorded and we will post that to the website within the next week. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Kendall, for um, all of your knowledge about the exam and preparation. And again, our contact information is here on this slide. So if you have any other additional questions, feel free to reach out by email. All right. All right thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.